Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are talking about U.S. public opinion on Gaza with two guests. Stephen Miles is president of Win Without War, and Eva Galenis Rosenbaum is chief operating officer and former director of research and analysis at Rethink Media which is a nonprofit advocacy organization that supports movements through media and communications. Eva and Stephen, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much. Good to be here. So how far exactly apart is the U.S. public uh, from, from Congress, from major media outlets, from all kinds of institutions on Gaza? Well, I can start and then maybe Eva, you want to say a little bit about what the poll found. But I think the top line, uh, David, as you're alluding to, is that uh, the research that we did uh, back in December confirmed exactly what we've seen in other polling, which is that Washington, D.C. is in a very different place than the American public is on the question about what to do in relation to what's going on in Gaza. Uh, the American public overwhelmingly wants there to be a ceasefire. Uh, they view this as something that's necessary. They view the notion that we can some, uh, somehow uh, Hamas can be defeated on the battlefield uh, to be just not something that is true. And generally speaking, they just think about these things out of step with how Washington thinks about them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. You know, the only thing I would add to that is that we were actually really surprised with just how stark the findings were in the poll. Um, we really expected there to be much more of a partisan split, and I think we can talk some more about that. We expected there to be more of an age split. Um, a lot of the media portrayal of um, public opinion on this issue is these big cavernous um, splits between different sectors of the population, and that really isn't what we found. There's not an age split? Young people aren't smarter than old people on this? <laughs> well, we can debate that another time, but... You know, what we found was that certainly younger people were more in favor of a ceasefire and um, more in support of political candidates who call for a ceasefire, but not significantly more. We really expected to see a much bigger age gap than we actually found, um, and that older um, generations are also very much in support of a ceasefire. And, and there's not a partisan split either or not a big one. Yeah, similarly, we we really expected to see a much bigger gap between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. Um, and, you know, public opinion is shifting quite rapidly on this issue compared to other ones. Um, so it's possible that in the future, um, the different parties or groups of partisans may settle in a different place. But at the moment, what we're seeing is that most people from every party and every part of the political spectrum um, are really in favor of a, a halt to the fighting. Uh, Stephen, this would seem to mean that people running for office would need to campaign, sincerely or not, on something very different from what people in office are doing. Yeah, you know, this is this is one of the questions we looked at. Uh, it, you know, the the there's been pretty clear polling consistently throughout that the American public supports a ceasefire. Um, we took that one step further in our research and asked the question: Would you be more inclined, less inclined, or make no difference to your opinion towards a candidate if that candidate supported a ceasefire? What we found was a plurality: forty percent said, you know, this wouldn't make a difference. I, I'm going to support or oppose that candidate based on other issues. But twice as many people said they would be more inclined to support a candidate who supported a ceasefire as said the opposite, that they would be less inclined. That says very clearly that the political upside is on the side of supporting a ceasefire. Partisan difference, again, not orders of magnitude, but we certainly saw that, that, that this trend is even more true for Democratic voters than Republicans. So if you're a Democratic candidate, there is even more upside than our polling would, would indicate across the board for uh, you and your support if you if you call for a ceasefire. I think that's 180 from what Washington thinks, which is mind boggling. I mean, here you have something that poll after poll has told you, people want this policy. It shouldn't really be surprising that if people want a policy, they are more inclined to support politicians who pursue that policy. But in Washington, the conventional wisdom is the exact opposite, that if you call for a ceasefire, it's going to be political risky. This polling is very clear. The political upside is there for those calling for a ceasefire. The voters want it. They're going to support you if you do it. And that's the clear takeaway from, our, from what we found. 
but it sounds like it's something that could tip the balance uh, between two candidates who are otherwise equal. But if one of the candidates has an opinion you favor on an issue you care about dramatically more than this one, so it, it may be more in in primaries than in general elections that that it's a deciding factor, right? I think that's a very plausible scenario. I mean, I think I think when people talk about, you know, like I said, there's that plurality that says this is this is not going to be the deciding factor for their vote. We know there are plenty of other things that are going to be the deciding factor: reproductive rights, uh, economic issues, pocketbook issues, healthcare. You know, time and time again, we've seen some of these issues. But there's a large percentage of people who say this is going to influence their vote. Now, we didn't rank it in terms of 12 issues and which one is the most important. There will be other polls that do that in the months ahead, and and we'll get a sense of it. But Absolutely, this is something that a candidate is going to be able to differentiate themselves on. And again, the, the clear political upside, particularly on the Democratic side of the aisle, is being in favor of a ceasefire. Eva, I think Stephen already mentioned that the U.S. public doesn't seem sold on this notion of defeating Hamas through war. Um, but specifically, the language you used was, who agrees with this, this statement that history has shown that that won't work? Uh, and people seem to agree that history has shown that. Does this, does this actually indicate that human beings are actually learning from history? <laughs> well, I think that's a great question. And, you know, obviously one poll can't tell us the answer to exactly that. But I do think that there's pretty clear evidence that Americans have learned from um, not just, you know, history in general, but the last couple of decades. Um, you know, I think what we saw in polling, you know, well before this one, we, we looked at a lot of polling around the 20th commemoration of 9-11 and polling, you know, in the 20 years before that. And what we saw was a real shift in the way that Americans were thinking about and viewing American uh, military engagement abroad. I think a lot of Americans have seen over the last 20 plus years that our engagements um, and our attempts to, you know, root out these non-state actors have really not succeeded. You know, whether you'd call them an abject failure or just not as successful as we'd want, we can we can differ on language. But I do think that Americans are showing really clearly in poll after poll that um, they see that these these have not been really successful engagements and. Although a lot of people may not be actively applying that to this situation, when they're presented with that contrast, with that comparison, I think that they are able to apply that and say, yeah, wait a minute, you know, history has shown this, we know this very well as Americans, and we really don't think this can be successful. I'm I'm a little bit surprised at how how smart people are in these polls, uh, in part because, and maybe I shouldn't be, and maybe it's because the polling is anonymous. But there's this accusation of anti-Semitism the minute anyone opposes this war. People are losing their jobs, losing their art exhibits, losing their concerts, losing their uh, their uh, positions at universities. Uh, are, are you surprised by that? Do you think this means this accusation of anti-Semitism isn't working? Or is it because people can answer polling anonymously? Hmm. Eva, I'm happy to jump in here. Yeah, I mean, please. Ahead, ahead. Look, I am, I am a Jewish American and, and, and there's, there's a very clear reality to seeing levels of anti-Semitism around the country on the rise. Similar, there's a lot of anti-Muslim hate out there. These issues are inflaming people. But I think you're right that we're seeing them falsely ascribed to people who want to see the violence stop. And the reality of why there's such widespread violence or why there's such, such widespread support for ending this violence, which I think comes through in the polling, is that people don't believe that pursuing this level of violence, that pursuing this kind of military solution is going to solve the underlying problem of a threat like Hamas. You know, they don't actually think that it's going to bring hostages home to continue carpet bombing Gaza in the way that we're seeing. And so, you know, when we tested various messages later in the polling, 
overwhelmingly the message that performed the best was people wanting to see the hostages freed. They want to see the hostages released, but they also understand that the only thing that has successfully freed a large number of hostages has been diplomacy, has been talking, has been a ceasefire, that that was actually the thing that accomplished what they want to see, which is a world in which Israeli lives and Palestinian lives are safe from the level of violence that we're seeing. So I think that when pe people inherently understand that, and that's why you see these results coming through in polling, what you don't have is a discourse in Washington, D.C. that allows for that. You don't have a discourse in Washington, D.C. that recognizes that what most people say when they say, we want this violence to stop, is that they want this violence to stop because they see the humanity of Israelis, because they see the humanity of Palestinians. That's just not the political debate we're having, but that is, I think, the underlying reality of why people in this country want that violence to stop. It's, yeah. it's very... Sorry, go ahead, Eva. Oh, I, I would just add that what our poll was looking at specifically was uh, the sector of Americans that are sort of in the middle on this issue. These are folks who don't have really strong opinions one way or the other about U.S. support for Israel. And I think that distinction is important because usually the public debate is really controlled by the loudest voices. Um, on either side of the debate. And what we were interested in finding out was what, what do the voices in the middle actually think? You know, what are the voices that are a little bit quieter um, really saying to us or what would they like to be saying to us? And I think what this poll really shows is that people in the middle on this issue who don't really have those strong views, but do have opinions clearly, um, you know, they're clearly expressing those opinions. And one really strong opinion here is stop the fighting let's find a peaceful solution to this um to this issue you know i can't prove it maybe you can uh, but i suspect a lot more effort goes into testing what messages persuade people to support wars than what messages persuade people to oppose wars so it's very interesting to me that you were testing the latter and i'm interested in anything else you learned on what messages do people find unpersuasive or persuasive well, I think that um, one of the findings from our our recent poll actually is, you know, something that just is in the long line of other findings um, in research that we have done that others have conducted, which is that humanizing the issue is really persuasive. You know, um, in conflicts, it's very often the case that the way that they get portrayed is sort of these broad, um, overarching conflicts between two state powers or two, um, two groups, and we're not really talking about the individuals. On the other hand, what really doesn't work is what I would call name calling, um, labeling the conflict or labeling some of the actors in it. Um, as evil or, um, you know, using words like genocide, which I think are really um, important words to use in a policy debate, but are not that persuasive to most audiences, particularly audiences in the middle of this issue who don't really have already formed strong views on that. Very what else would you add, Stephen? Anything? Well, I mean, I think I think you know David's absolutely right. Obviously, there's a lot more money uh, to be made on the side of promoting war than than on the side of stopping it. And so, I think you're right that we have seen. You know, there is always more research in, out there into kind of how do you uh, how do you convince people to be afraid? How do you convince people to 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 fear these sorts of things? And that's one of the reasons I think we were so excited to to invest in this kind of research to figure out exactly where people are because this is something that. You know, it's, to, to Eva's point, where people are seeing this in real time, they're seeing this on their smartphones, they're seeing social media, they're seeing human stories of the violence happening. This yeah. this is how wars are fought in the modern era. It's not they're not, not reading about it in the paper and hearing a debate about you know Israel versus Hamas in the abstract terms of governments and organizations. They're understanding the real world human impact of the hostages that were taken on October 7th, uh, the Israelis and others that were killed that day, the folks, uh, Palestinians and others who have been killed in, in Gaza in the days since by the, by, the, by the IDF and others, they're hearing and seeing the humanity of this war. And it was important to us to understand how that's impacting people. And I think that this is important to understand as we're going forward, because it is going to be how people experience wars moving forward. 
I wish we could go on, including the whole question of uh, what moves Congress members who clearly are not <laughs> ignorant and presidents who clearly are not ignorant of what the polls are saying. Uh, we've been speaking with Stephen Miles of Win Without War and with Eva Galenis Rosenbaum of Rethink Media. We will have links to the work up at talkworldradio.org. Thank you, Eva and Stephen, for coming on Talk World Radio. Thanks Thank so you. much. Now we turn to Trita Parsi, who is an award-winning author and the 2010 recipient of the Graumeyer Award for Ideas Improving World Order. He is the Executive Vice President of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft and an expert on U.S.-Iranian relations. Trita Parsi, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for being here. I've just been speaking with other guests about polling, showing strong U.S. public support for ending the war on Gaza. And I would be interested both in your thoughts on why that support is so strong and why it is so at odds with the president, the Congress, major media outlets, and all kinds of U.S. institutions. It's a great question. And then, first of all, you're absolutely right. The public is completely against this. Um, there isn't any support, particularly when they take into account the risk of escalation that would drag the U.S. into it. There's absolutely no support for the U.S. going back into another war in the Middle East. What's fascinating is that you have similar numbers in other democracies in which, again, the governments are taking these extremist positions in favor of the war, um, uh, objecting to the South African claim without actually having investigated the matter uh, in terms of genocide. Uh, but their publics are not with them. Even in Germany, in which essentially debate has more or less been uh, suffocated, 61% are in opposition to the idea that what Israel is doing is justified. I think what we're seeing is partly that the president has come out so hard and so early in taking a position and essentially forced most of the members of his party to go along with him on that issue. Uh, thankfully, the progressives broke. I think the progressives could have broken with a lot of other policies on foreign policy that the president had pursued in the past. But all of this fear that if we do anything against Biden, Trump will come back actually has created a, a, a situation in which we don't have politics the way we did in the past, in which members of Congress were independent. They were part of a party and they had their own opinions. Nevertheless, that's been less and less the reality in Washington for the last 20 years now and even more so in the last uh, eight or so years. Uh, and I think it's highly problematic, but I think it only means that the bar for public opinion to make its mark on foreign policy is unfortunately higher than it has been in the past. But that doesn't mean that it can't work. It doesn't mean that it, it's lost to the public opinion indefinitely can be ignored. In fact, I don't believe that the Biden administration's policy is sustainable, not only because it's not working, it's not working in terms of what the Israelis are doing in Gaza uh, against Hamas, but also because the public opinion in the country, the international opinion, all of it is turning dramatically against this. And let me just add one potential data point here. If the International Court of Justice finds Israel to be guilty or preliminarily the South Africans make uh, a successful claim to say that it is plausible that the Israelis are committing genocide and there is an injunction against Israel. That's going to have a huge impact on public opinion uh, and it's going to have a huge impact on other issues. You know, the Biden administration's talk about the rules based order, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's going to be extremely difficult for the United States to evade increasing accusations then that the Biden administration is aiding and abetting a genocide uh, in Gaza, mindful of the fact that the U.S. is the primary provider of weapons as well as military advice to the Israelis throughout these last three months. These so-called democracies that you mentioned, Trita, are, of course, at best representative republics uh, that often are not very representative. I is it really the fear of Trump and, and the, the, the sort of perversion of all things by an election that's 10 months away that, that's driving everything in the United States and, and even in other countries uh, where Trump is not up for election? Or are there other factors that are moving elected officials and, and universities and media outlets and all kinds of institutions to oppose the public? 
No, I think you're right. You can't pin all of that on uh, the fear of Trump. I think it is a factor in the United States, an exaggerated factor. Uh, it's a factor that also has been addressed the wrong way. Um, and we can just see it right now. The best way of um, uh, making sure that the Democrats have a chance against Trump uh, in the elections in 2024 is not to just blindly follow whatever the Biden administration is doing and never ever criticizing, never ever scrutinizing. That is the absolute wrong way of dealing with that problem, the extent to which the Trump factor is the key factor. But there are, of course, other factors. You have all of these different organizations, etc., that are putting pressure and trying to uh, shame and, and get people fired. Uh, you see that in the political realm, et, et cetera, in which people think that they have to take these kind of positions in order to be politically viable. All of these things come together here, but they're coming together in a matter, in a manner that is worse than I think we've ever seen. Um, mindful not only of the atrocities in Gaza, which is the worst that we've seen in a very, very long time, but also in terms of the complete disconnect uh, that we're seeing in terms of how, uh, for instance, it was so easy for the Biden administration to make determinations from far away that the Russians had committed genocide, that they had committed war crimes. But when it comes to Gaza, they're dismissing it and saying they cannot make a judgment until they looked into it. And at the same time, they admit they're not looking into it. And then they come out and say and that the uh, South African claim at the International Court of Justice is without merit, even though they never looked into it. Um, I mean, the, the double standards, the hypocrisies are now at a level that is just too painful to bear. And of course, the International Criminal Court, exact same hypocrisy on Russia and on Palestine. Uh, if the International Court of Justice, and I'm not predicting this, and I'm certainly not hoping for it, but if the International Court of Justice rules against even a plausible case for the most obvious public genocide uh, that we've seen, what will that do to international institutions, to the world's uh, relationship to the United Nations and the very idea of international law? I mean, this is actually a chance of making sure that these institutions redeem themselves and show themselves to be relevant and capable up to par as the language is in uh, at the UN to be able to deal with the problems today. If they do not if they reject this, mindful of all the footage, all of the statements, as you know, one of the critical elements of being able to prove genocide is to show intent. That's where I think the case is the strongest in the South African claim because of uh, the statements, the numerous statements by Israeli uh, government officials themselves. If that turns out not to be enough, then I think it pokes a huge hole in, in the validity of that institution, and that will bleed into other institutions that are already increasingly losing legitimacy. The Security Council makeup, for instance, is based on the geopolitical realities of 1945. Just in the last 15 years, the world has changed dramatically. Imagine how much it has changed since 1945, yet efforts to be able to reform it remains blocked. And the risk, of course, is that if nothing is done, these institutions will become irrelevant. And at that point, we will have an international system in which even some of these imperfect instruments to be able to maintain a degree of law and order will no longer uh, be in existence or be effective. What do you think, Trita Parsi, people who care can do, should be doing locally, nationally, globally, uh, with friends and neighbors who claim not to know anything is happening in Gaza? What, what are the most useful actions people can take right now? Well, time is of the, of the essence here. So I think people need to act fast. And one of the things I think they should be doing is to contacting their members of Congress. There's only about 64 or so members of Congress that have come out in support of a ceasefire, which is a small minority um, uh, of the entire Congress, compared that to more than 70 plus percent of the American public that wants a ceasefire. And I think one thing the American public should, the case they should be making to the members of Congress is that if there isn't a ceasefire, there will very likely be a larger war in the region and the US will be dragged into it. And these members of Congress will be held responsible for having helped drag the US into that war by not acting to prevent it. And the best way of preventing it is through a ceasefire. 
sadly, that list of 64 Congress members who have come out for a ceasefire is something like two thirds of them. It's it's very vague, if not actually contradictory. And I, I'm for a ceasefire after Hamas has surrendered and all the hostages are freed and so forth. Right. I mean, it's it's a much smaller list that have said, actually, the Israeli government needs to stop killing people in Gaza. Um, I don't know the detail if there are people on that list who have not been completely clear cut. You may be right on that. Uh, getting them to move in that direction, of course, is is crucial. Um, and, and I think it is if, if they're saying things such as I'm in, in favor of a ceasefire when everything is over, uh, that is a rather meaningless statement. I would uh, definitely agree with you on that. Yeah. Speaking of, uh, you know, loyalty to Biden against Trump for years on end, uh, what do you make of the comments, correct up to a point, of numerous Congress members that President Biden is violating the Constitution with war making on Yemen? Uh, and in the next breath from the same Congress members, the important thing to do is to reelect him and never a mention of what the Constitution says, namely, you impeach such things. I, first of all, on the issue of um, the Constitution, I do believe that there is a violation there because these were not attack against American ships. The attacks against American ships occurred after the Biden administration started shooting at the Houthis. Uh, and the Biden administration had a much better option to be able to prevent the Houthi attacks, and that's by going along with the ceasefire. That's the demand of all of these different groups that have risen the temperature. But more importantly, it's a demand that we should be making because it lies in our interest to have a ceasefire in the Middle East, in, in Gaza and Israel, because it prevents the escalation towards a larger war. It pacifies the Israeli-Lebanese border, the Red Sea, Iraqi militias attacking US troops. But of course, also, it wins the release of the Israeli hostages and it ends the bloodshed, the carnage in Gaza. So we have an interest in doing so, and we shouldn't be uh, uh, reacting allergically to it in the manner that the Biden administration has done. Uh, but the Biden administration never even examined that option. Instead, they violated another principle they had put forward, which was to say that military action is the option of last resort. Here it was the option of first resort. They never tried diplomacy before they started taking military action. And by taking military action, they've only mat made matters worse, as we see the president himself admitted that it's not working. Um, but in terms of coming out and saying they shouldn't be voting for um, uh, Biden, I don't think that's very likely you will see that from members of Congress. But I think from community leaders, um, organizations, however, who are in the political field, my organization is not, I'm a little bit surprised that so many of them already come out and say that they will, while they at the same time have all these other complaints. At a minimum, it seems to me it would be worthwhile to say that it's a question. It's a question mark as to whether they will or not. It depends on what Biden does. It depends on whether Biden earns back their votes by going for a ceasefire and by that using their leverage to be able to influence the president rather than completely giving up their leverage at the outset uh, and then expecting that Biden will listen to them. Very well said. Trita Parsi, where can people go to follow your work and keep up with what you're doing? They should go to the Quincy Institute's website, which is quincyinst.org, or to my personal website, which is tritaparsi.com. Very good. Trita Parsi, thank you for everything you're thank doing. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming Appreciate on Talk it. World Radio. Thank you. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.